You know, we live in a culture in which sports are a way that people spend a lot of their time and money as participating or as spectators. Play is a theological concept. And it is in an act of play that God created us, and in an act of play that we are recreated, as in recreation. Play is transcendent, takes us out of time. And one might say that the church is a community of play, delight and joy in God. And I'm a huge sports fan myself, and I brought my teens here. <laughs> Do I dare say go caps in here? I did bring mine. My so, um, but my teams let me down this <laughs> That's why I'm, I have faith in God, right? <laughs> my, my sports team let me down. But anyway, how do sports interface with the Christian faith? David Campbell is going to address that with his research. I'm not doing too much physical activity, I promise. So sport and the Christian faith. Do those two things go together? At times, it, it kind of seems like they're at odds with one another, and they kind of bring out the less appealing characteristics, maybe, of both sides. We've all witnessed cheating, anger, and dishonesty on the sports field, and in the sports arena, and no doubt we've even seen it in the church. We've even, but we've also seen the brighter side of their relationship, the fair play the community, and the deep spiritual moments that leave us in awe. We even choose to name special sporting moments with the words of faith. When the young amateur U.S. hockey team defeated the heavily favored Soviets in the 1980 Winter Olympics, it was called, anyone? The Miracle on Ice. When Franco Harris of the Pittsburgh Steelers corralled a tipped pass from quarterback Terry Bradshaw in the AFC Championship game and ran it into the end zone for the winning touchdown, it was called, anyone? The Immaculate Reception. The immaculate reception. <laughs> in the 1986 World Cup of Soccer, Argentinian Diego Maradona scored an infamous goal by cleverly and illegally using his hand to put the ball in the net without the referee noticing. This became known as the hand of God. <laughs> and when a football team has one play left in the game and they need to score a touchdown, they call for a very well-known play, the Hail, Mary. the Hail Mary Pass. And I don't think it would be much of a stretch to say that many people consider this man, Wayne Gretzky, to be a hockey god. He is called the Great One, which actually I believe he was named, that's the Great Gatsby is where they actually got that from. So it's not necessarily a reference to God, but one, many would consider him a hockey god. Clearly, sport and faith do have some kind of relationship, and it's one that I think is worth exploring. My relationship with sport has had a profound impact on my life. I could stand here for quite a lengthy time, and I'm very serious about that, and tell you why and how sport has impacted my life. But instead, to explain my relationship to sport, I thought I would begin by sharing with you the opinions of those closest to me. I asked my wife, my mother, and my father 
to comment on the first thing that comes to mind when they think of my life in sport. My wife Sarah says, you would not exist without sports. It's just who you are. My mother said, from the time that you were a little kid, you didn't want toys. You wanted sports equipment. And my father said, you're fanatical. You live, eat, and breathe sports. <laughs> Not everyone would get up in the morning and turn on Sports Center first thing. <laughs> what do we watch every morning, honey? Every morning. Every morning. <laughs> She's used to it now. <laughs> By the time I could walk, I had a bat and a ball in my hand. This is my father's cricket team back from back home in Bermuda. And they're on tour in Toronto in this picture, actually. And that is me right there in the middle at age two. As a young boy, if I wasn't playing a sport, I was glued to my television set, watching my heroes on TV. Michael Jordan, Pete Sampras, Brian Lara, and many more. I would dream of slipping on the jerseys of my favorite teams, hearing the crowd roar, and ultimately winning that championship, whichever championship it might be. I also spent a fair amount of time apologizing to my parents for the number of windows of our house that I broke. And I think the number of broken windows ranges somewhere from 10 to 20 using baseballs, cricket balls, and even golf balls. Over time, I have come to realize that my relationship with sport has a deeper meaning. I can experience God in a way that is almost indescribable. I have wondered for the past several years if others felt this way as well. And whether or not this love for sport that I and possibly others share could even be an effective tool for ministry. Is the connection of sport and faith one that the church can invest in? I did not know what I wanted to do for this grad project at the start of the year. I tossed around a few ideas, and eventually I sent Dr. Wilhock an email saying that two of my greatest passions in life are sport and ministry. And I wondered if there is any way that I could explore how they could work together. And Dr. Wilhock replied with, this is fantastic. <laughs> Come and see me so we can discuss it. <laughs> and so my research topic was born. In consultation with Dr. Wilhock, thank you, and my advisors, we came to a research question. Can sport enhance the Christian faith? Now, understandably, this is a broad topic. There are many different avenues that one could take when exploring sport and faith. Therefore, I chose to focus on a few areas in particular. I wanted to understand an individual's relationship to sport and what their engagement in sport actually means to them. I wanted to explore the spiritual side of sport and see if others find it to be a meaningful way of connecting with God. Is the engagement in sport a time where we can find God, or does it take us to a place where God is not seen, heard, or even thought of? Where do the challenges of the integration of sport and faith lie? Are there challenges that we face as individuals? as communities, and as a nation where sport and faith are concerned? And finally, what are the opportunities for collaboration, for the collaboration of sport and Christian faith in the future? My methodology for this research was a qualitative study, like many of the projects that you've heard so far this week. I used the phenomenological method of research. The goal of this method is to describe the lived experience of a phenomenon. In this case, it is the participant's experience of sport and faith. I interviewed four participants, three of them male and one female. 
Each of them are ministry personnel within the United Church of Canada. These participants combined had experience in various types of ministry, covering rural, urban, and suburban communities. I'd like you to meet my participants. Blades, hoops, skis, and sneakers. I chose the name for these part their names for these participants based on the sport which I felt they most identified with, even though some of them identified with multiple sports. And you'll learn more about them as we go along. After examining the content of the interviews, these are the primary themes that emerged from my data. There was an understanding conveyed by all of the participants that there is very much a team concept that sport and faith communities share. That the dynamics of the team, the community, and the church are important to each carrying out its goals. In the individual dynamics, participants talked about how they were able to understand their own gifts and limits through sport and what this meant for their ministry. In problem dynamics, the participants articulated the challenges that are present where sport and faith are concerned and the way in which certain tensions affect their possibility for collaboration. And finally, future dynamics. Future dynamics contain the examples of where the merging of sport and faith has worked well and where there are future opportunities for their work together. Now these are not the only themes that emerge from my data, but these are the themes that were common threads throughout the interviews, and they were ones with which the richest content arose. Now let's take a look at the experiences and the beliefs of these individuals. We begin with team dynamics. There is a need within a faith community for its members to function as a team. To be the body of Christ is to utilize the different abilities and skills of the body to do Christ's work in the world. Each of those parts of the body has its own function, but would be weaker without the support of the other parts. 1 Corinthians 12 reminds us of the workings of the body of Christ and the variety of gifts that are activated in us by the Spirit. Blades, who is a part of a ministry team in an urban church, said, When I'm putting a church service together, I see it as a team. All of us, the organist, the minister, lay leaders, the greeters, we're all a team. We all have very different roles and we work together in concert to be a team. He went on to describe the church as a team, not just from the point of view that there is a task at hand and all of us need to take up an equal portion, but rather the view that there are complementary skills within the people that helps everything to fit together. Phil Jackson, arguably one of the greatest basketball coaches ever for the Chicago Bulls and the Los Angeles Lakers, he speaks of teamwork when he says, the strength of the team is each individual member. The strength of each member is the team. Hoops is a minister in a small rural town, and he says that faith is meant to be a team sport especially in the church where we work together and we all have our unique gifts and skills that we bring to it. He uses the choir as an illustration of this point. He says the choir illustrates quite visibly what it means to be a team. They are a small part of the church. Together all their voices are different, but together they make one common sound. They also, he said, wear the same uniform. A secondary theme which emerged within team dynamics was the way in which sport embodies Christian values. Participants saw sport as an opportunity to show the way in which we live our lives as Christians. Whether winning or losing, there is always the opportunity to do so with grace and humility. Sports can be very black and white. 
The outcomes can be good or bad, and it's all about how we choose to handle those outcomes. Kindness and obedience. Treating others with kindness embodies a sense of fair play. We have a choice of whether to play within the rules or to break them. We have similar choices in life which says much about who we are as Christian people. Being a witness to others in the community through sport is vital to our having a face in the community. We can witness to others through the way we conduct ourselves inside and outside the church. Volunteering by coaching and refereeing is one of the many ways in which we take part in service to others and love our neighbors as ourselves. We provide opportunities and we engage in service to one another by carrying on traditions and by embracing the gifts of others. There is also an opportunity for social justice in the sporting world. There are times of conflict in sport and there is a chance for us to stand up and to add a voice when we see wrong happening. And finally, we have respect. We can have respect for one another, our teammates, our opponents, and officials. And we can recognize that we are all creations of God who seek to use our bodies and skills in devotion to love of a game. My second primary theme emerged from the participants' articulation of their personal relationship with sport and how it had informed their faith. The most resounding point that came from the questions on this dynamic was that sport had been an incredibly formative experience for the participants beginning in their youth. Skis, a minister in a rural area, stated, it's just always been a really important part of who I am and how I live my life. I grew up in a family where being active was really important. Blades described his abundance of energy. I was born hyperactive. I physically could not sit still. I didn't have ADHD though, because I could focus like a laser beam. So I got involved in organized sport. It gave me a kind of acceptable way, like a vessel to put that energy into. Sneakers, serving a rural congregation, describes sport as being a very formative thing in his life. I grew up in a rural area, he said. I was a withdrawn student, and I felt like a fish out of water. In grade 10, I got involved in volleyball and suddenly realized that I could fit in. There was a niche here. Hoops explained that playing sports has shaped who I am. That's all I wanted to do, and that's how I wanted to be identified. Theologian Michael Koppel, in his book, Open-Hearted Ministry, talks about how we embody play. He says, play as embodied theology puts us in touch with the natural rhythm of life. Through my discussions with the participants, I discovered that there was a deeper side to this theme an aspect where the participants found a deep connection to their faith through sport. Skis talked about the idea of the body as a temple. Sports allows you to keep your body in shape, which I think is a way of honoring God. I see sport as a way of connecting with God on a spiritual level. She continued to talk about her experiences of running and skiing outdoors. She described this feeling when doing those sports as a moment where there is nothing else between you and God, and you have a sense that God is in your body. Sneakers described his experiences with regard to running in marathons, and he says, it's oneness with creation. Like your mind goes to a place and says, this is as good as it can get, and I'm going to stay here. And there is nothing else in life that has given me that feeling. He went on to describe this feeling as a time of excitement. But this is beyond excitement, he says. 
This is a sense of almost serenity. And you want to, if you could, to bottle it and hold on to it. In every activity that I do, he says, I try to find that moment. Within individual dynamics, there was also a secondary theme of discernment, especially when it came to one's understanding of their limits. Both hoops and blades described how sport helped them to learn that they can't be good at everything. They know what their limitations are, but it doesn't stop them from playing and using their gifts in the best ways possible. It also helped them to discern where their gifts were best suited for ministry. Skis and sneakers approach the idea of limits in a slightly different way. Skis talked about the challenge of sport and pushing one's limits. She says you can always do more than you think. You learn not to be scared of pushing yourself. God is with you in pushing those limits. Sneakers ran straight forward into the way our Christian teachings inform our understanding of limits. I think our Christian teachings tell us that there is no limit. He says, if people had believed in limits, it all would have ended at the crucifixion. And it didn't. It didn't end with the resurrection, and it didn't end with the ascension. It carried on, because there was more to it than that. Despite the affinity that many people have with sport, we know that there is another side to how it is played and how it is portrayed in society. Sneakers discuss the challenge of secularism. He said that sport takes us into risk and says, push it to the limit. But secular society says, no, get out of there. Don't get hurt. Don't be stupid. He also talked about how some people think that religion should be left in the church, and that our faith isn't as big a part of our lives outside of the church. Blades discuss the rising sense of individualism in society. He said, we are a society that increasingly does things alone. We are fractured. The wealthy people build big houses and move into private areas so that they can be alone. We're not as communal as we used to be. There is also a tension with the huge income gap between the people in the pews and the people who are our heroes. At times, we seem to make gods out of these athletes. We put them on pedestals. It separates us from them and makes it seem like we almost have to be at their level to even engage in a sport, which makes people less willing to try a sport for the first time. Skis mentioned that there are certainly people who when you approach them will just say, oh, I don't do sports. She thinks that it has something to do with people having the mindset that they have to be an elite athlete to even enjoy sports. Within the problem dynamics emerged one of the more significant themes of sport being pitted against the church. Participants express that they quite often hear members of the church lamenting the lack of youth in the church, and often blaming hockey for that lack of youth. For many churchgoers, this is where the argument against sport begins. Regarding this issue, Sneakers says, there has always been an uneasiness between the two groups. In this case, he was talking about hockey and church. Because there's competition. I've heard people call those minor hockey guys, that's the competition over there. Well, if we're competing with them, he says, we're losing badly. In terms of the church's response to the groups, that they compete with, Sneakers says, the church just sits there and grinds its teeth, to use an expression. And I think we've done too much grinding. 
We've almost admitted defeat and said that there is nothing that we can do. Throughout the interviews, the participants gave examples as to where they thought the use of sport in the church had worked well. They also gave their thoughts as to, wh as to what the possibilities were for a more intentional relationship between sport and the church. And I'd like to share a few of those with you now in my final theme, Future Dynamics. Some of the participants pointed out that many churches have gymnasiums attached to their buildings. Blades noted that most churches from a bygone era have gyms. I think it's kind of interesting that they're not really used anymore. They are, but they're not used for that purpose, the purpose of sport. He went on to express a desire for the church to find a way to use gymnasiums as a social place whereby there was a way of doing sport communally. Hoops says that many youth groups have been filled because of the promise of sport. It's no coincidence that a lot of churches, your bigger churches especially, have gyms where folks can go and play. Sneakers told me a story uh, in his interview. He said it was a story that had actually been passed on to him, and I want to share that with you now. There was a church that used to have a coffee hour before their worship service on Sunday mornings. And at some point, the parishioners started to complain that not enough people were coming to this coffee hour, which eventually evolved into not enough people are coming to worship on Sunday morning. So the minister, in consultation with, uh, and they basically, sorry, they basically said that one of the chief reasons for this was because all those families, they're down the street at the hockey arena on Sunday mornings. That's why we don't have anybody here. So the minister, in consultation with some of the parishioners, got together and they decided that on Sunday mornings they would take coffee down to the hockey rink, compliments of the church. And this actually resulted in some new faces showing up at worship and at other church events because they believed that the church actually cared about what was going on in their lives. It's amazing how such a simple act can promote community. Participants spoke of the use of sport as a way of making connections. It's a great way of meeting new people and connecting with the wider community. It's also a great way of giving the church a face in the community. If the minister or other congregation members volunteer to coach or to referee or get involved in any sport, it gives the community a sense that the church is present and involved. Sneakers brought up the question of whether worship actually needs to take place in the church every Sunday morning. If five of our kids are playing an important hockey game, or sorry, an important soccer game, why don't we send the congregation out to the field? Why don't we have a service right beside the field where the game is going on? After we have our service, we'll go and watch the game. So where does this leave us after hearing the experiences of these sport and faith enthusiasts? From the data, it seems clear that there are too many positive ways in which sport and faith connect to ignore them. Their formative nature and contribution to a person's discovering of their identity. Their ways in which they allow us to experience the holy and their capability to promote community. That being said, there are many challenges that are really difficult to ignore. The battle of sport and church for Sunday morning. The growing secularism that discourages us from taking our faith outside of the church. And the aura that we've created for the professional athletes of our world. This brings us back to the research question that I began with. Can sport enhance the Christian faith? The overwhelming response to this question from my participants was, yes. 
There is ample opportunity for sport and faith to connect in ways that are meaningful. Both sport and religion provide spaces and times where people can work together toward a common goal, praising God and being transformed spiritually. The need for dialogue and engagement between sport and religion is at an all-time high if the church is to regain its focus in our increasingly secular world. There are opportunities available for community where sport and faith converge. And from the data that my participants appeared to be giving me, it seemed that they were saying that rather than being enemies, why don't we become neighbors? The Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Romans that we can offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. If a member or even a potential member is not attending Sunday morning worship or another church event because they're at a sporting event, do we have to assume that they are not worshiping God? Like Paul says, we can offer our bodies as living sacrifices. If so, then can we believe that these people engaging in sport are worshiping God with their bodies as well? I think we can. We could even educate our youth and the rest of our members about the different ways we can worship God that may not take place in the sanctuary. And we can do that from the pulpit. We can do that in Sunday school. And we can certainly do that by being present in the community where sport is happening. If we can open ourselves to the possibilities then I believe that we can all see sport as a well-played phenomenon that can inform and enhance our faith. Thank you. And now I'm ready for whatever you might throw at me. <laughs> ministry doesn't work out for you, you have a career as a southern redneck impersonator. <laughs> I don't think this is work. Uh, yeah. yep, okay. yeah. Questions? Great presentation, David. Uh, as a father of three, son hockey player, daughter captain of her basketball team, daughter captain of her volleyball team, Sunday morning was a wasteland for church in our lives. Uh, you're right, the, the Sunday morning competition is fierce mm -hmm. for all of our denominations. Two points. One, Friday night in Edmonston, the entire community is out for the hockey game. Mm -hmm. The priest is there, clerical garb on, mm -hmm. the, the collar's on, he's working the room. <laughs> and he's very effective at it. There's a thousand people in this hockey rink mm -hmm. on a Friday night the competition's heavy. This is an evangelical event mm -hmm. that's going on right before our eyes and there's no Protestant clergy persons anywhere to be seen. Two, the, uh, the notion that in sport there is a faith that comes through it, having participated like you, you build a relationship with those people in that room, mm -hmm. good and bad. Mm -hmm. It's life and God is in there with you in, in the good times and in the bad times. So as faith groups, we need to be where the sports are being played. Mm -hmm. So my, com my question to you is, did you sense in your, your, uh, your research a notion of evangelization going on? The Catholic Church is, is actively pursuing a new evangelism we're getting beat badly on Sunday mornings, and if we don't get off our butts, we're going to get beat even worse. And the only way you can reach out is through an evangelical approach. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that's being shared by anybody else. There wasn't as much talk of a kind of an evangelicalization or that kind of process going forward. But what was coming out of, of the data was that we've got to stop making the people at the rink the others. Right? If we just sit here and complain and whine, and that's, quite frankly, 
That's all we've been doing for a long time about this, is how is there ever going to be possibility for relationship? It's just not going to happen. Because we sit there, right? we can't view uh, sport on Sunday morning as a competition. Because if both sides do that, well, then you're just going to be competing for the rest of the time. And quite frankly, like uh, Sneaker said, we're losing and we're losing badly. Um, and it's hard to argue with that. Uh, he, Sneakers actually mentioned the story that um, another minister was saying to him. Sneakers had a lot of great stuff to say. It was a fantastic interview. He said, you know, if you have team ministry, why don't we send one of our ministers down to the hockey rink on Sunday morning? Great way to open up community. Great way to be a face in the community, to open up dialogue, and to let people know that we're there and we care. And the other thing is, if, if there is such a tension here that we can't, you know, get anyone to see that, you know, both of these things are important or that, you know, we, people won't come over to the church on Sunday mornings, well, if we can get families into the church, maybe we need to hold a worship service on another time, a Sunday evening, a Saturday evening. Now, you can say, well, you know, young families, they're busy. But if it's really important to them, they will be there. One of my participants also said, you know, I had a couple of families come and sit down with me and say, look, the church is important to our lives. The sport is really important to our kids' lives, but they've got, you know, we've got little Jimmy here and Annie, and they've got hockey on Sunday mornings. And that means, you know, my husband and I, we're, we're moving back and forth all over the place here. Is it okay if we come into worship 15 minutes late? And she responded with, yes, I'm happy that you're coming. I'm happy that you're here. She said, okay, well, sometimes we might have to leave a few minutes before the end of the service. That's okay. We're happy you're here, and we're glad that you want this faith community to be involved in your life. So, just, just a few things. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Dave. Um, I have a question. Uh, regarding the camaraderie that happens around sports, uh, per, uh, in particular around professional sports, and I don't know if you touched on this in your uh, research or not, was there any, I mean, you and I have it against the Leafs and the Canadians. <laughs> go have to go. <laughs> Uh, was any of that brought up within your interviews regarding the camaraderie that happens, the competitive side against watching professional sports teams, or were you mo mostly focusing on playing the actual game? Um, there was a bit of both. Uh, so Sneakers, again, he was one who talked about, he, he runs a lot of marathons, and that's really where he, he uh, found a huge love for sport. And uh, he said that in the past year, he said two people that he used to run against passed away. And that really saddened him. He said, now these aren't the type of people that I would call up to say, hey, how's it going? But he said, they're the kind of people that they get to the race and you say, oh good, he's here, <laughs> right? <laughs> but afterwards, they would chat, they would have fun. And they knew that there was, there was a camaraderie there, but there was also a competitiveness. But they were able to kind of hold those two. Uh, in, in tandem, and it was able to work. And like you said, he's like, you know, we weren't best friends, but I'm really going to miss them. Um, in terms of, can you repeat the part about the professional aspect? Yeah. Um, so when people have certain teams that they cheer for, and they know that, oftentimes there's jokes around congregations, but some yeah. people cheer for the Leafs, some people cheer for the Canadians, or whatever team uh, it is. Does that ever affect the relationships in the community that can happen inside the church. Did, did that get mentioned at all? Well, from, it didn't get mentioned at all. Um, but from what I've experienced, no. Now, again, that's from me being in certain areas, mainly in the Maritimes. Um, for example, Sarah's dad is, he claims he's not a Leafs fan, but he is a Leafs fan. He just claims that he's, he just, he just claims that he's an anti-Habs fan. Woo! <laughs> and, and her, so, her dad and the minister, the former minister at their church, used to go at it all the time about Montreal and Toronto. Right. And there's different, you know, one of the ways that one of my participants embraced that, he had a wear your jersey to church Sunday. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was great. And then they went and the, afterwards they had the family skate afterwards. So it's a way of embracing it. And, and you know, I don't think anyone takes it too seriously. Like you and I know, we go at it about that kind of thing. But you know I love you. And I hope you love me back. 
But you know, I, I don't think I don't think from what I've experienced here that we really take that too seriously. That there's a camaraderie that hey, we both love watching this kind of thing, and it's it's great that we can both support our teams in these ways. Yeah. So I'm not convinced that every child who plays hockey all plays at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. So based on that assumption, I'm curious about why you think people are choosing sport over the church experience. Um, I, think, I think that's uh, something that's been lacking on our part in the church. Because I think there's been a lack of helping people to see the way that sport and the church work. Like how you see sport, uh, how you see your faith in sport. I didn't recognize it until probably close to about the time I came here. The real, like, there's, there's these moments, Sneakers talked about those moments, where it's, just, it's a moment of awe. He said there's times when you can run a race and you just lose yourself. And you, all of a sudden it seems like you wake up and you don't know what happened for the past five minutes. And there's just this incredible experience that you want and you can't get back until it happens somewhere later down the road again. And what that is, and he, he was saying too, he's like, I started to recognize that that's just a spiritual moment. That's, that's me understanding where God is playing in my life. There's a oneness in creation. Again, I think we're, we're doing this thing where we're putting faith and sport against each other, and we're not really educating people as to the ways that those two things can come together. And I think that's really important for moving forward and I, I agree, I don't think every, every kid is playing hockey on, on Sunday morning, but I think we really need to work on that relationship. Thank you for your presentation. I just, this is not as much a question as I, I just want to say thank you because through all the presentations, talking about creation, talking about sports, talking about technology, talking about prayer, I feel really inspired, honestly. You're going with talking about the different things that people are doing, connecting sports to faith. And all I keep thinking about is my little hometown back in Labrador and all the wonderful things that we can do and how sports is something that, especially for the youth, people don't know how to connect with the youth. People aren't interested, as a lot of the youth aren't interested in arts, aren't interested in drama, some in music, but the main thing that um, that town is interested in is sports. They play all sorts of things. So that link between the connection of church and sports is... I think it, it's really important, and I really enjoyed your presentation. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. David, I found that very compelling. Thank you. And I am one of these people with like eight left feet who's useless at sports. So, um, and actually knows zip all about them. So, th so here's the question for you. I think you're right. It's a good way to connect with people. It's certainly a big deal in our society. Um, so for those of us who are um, useless and clueless when it comes to sports, how do we tap into this? Uh, part of it is a willingness on your part to say, okay, I'm going to try something new. But it's also, I, I think there's, and I talked a little bit about this, it's almost like sometimes there's this feeling that Oh, to play that, I've got to be really good at it. Well, nobody gets really good at it without learning how to play it first. I mean, sure, there's, there's natural ability that comes in those kinds of things. But it's a way of being in community where you can just relax and have fun. For example, uh, AST has a volleyball team. Now, sure. The sinister minister. The sinister ministers, that's right. <laughs> now, when we get together, there is a goal of, sure, if we can, we want to try and win. But I'm telling you right now, we have so much fun and we laugh so hard because we know that none of us are professional athletes. And we do, <laughs> you, can, you can hear them laughing in the back, right? We, <laughs> but, you know, we do silly things all the time. And we have to look at the lighter side of that and say, you know what, we're just here in community. We're enjoying ourselves. We're giving thanks that we have the ability to be able to do these things. And it's, yeah, it, there's, I know that there's a, there's a challenge with the comfort level, but it's also, I think, offering opportunities for people within the church to say, you don't have to be a professional to come and do this. Just come and have some fun. Try something new. If you don't like it, that's okay. There's other ways. Sport can be very communal as well in the supporting of one another, I really think. So. Yeah, that's always been nice. 
Michelle, you're knitting. Sorry. You're knitting. That's a sport, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, great presentation, Dave. Uh, two, two questions totally unrelated to one another. The first one, and I think you kind of touched on it a bit there, um, not everyone can engage in sports, mm -hmm. like, especially with regards to uh, aging populations, aging congregations. Mm -hmm. So how, how do they become a part of uh, this you know, relationship between church and sport? Mm -hmm. um, well, again, with sport, it, it's not always a, uh, a gauging in the physicalness of that. There, there is a, a great part to the physicality of the sport, but there's also a communal aspect in that you can get together with five people of any age and watch a hockey game and you share a love for that, right? You can get together to go to support a community hockey game, a community soccer game, being in community right there. That's a way that you can still enjoy the sport because in a way, like, you can still live those moments and that sport through the people that you see. You know, like, I've, I can live, uh, I can watch my father play cricket. I did as a little kid. And in a way, I, I feel like I'm him in some kind of senses. I, I feel what he feels. I feel the excitement. I feel the disappointment. I feel all those things. Um, but actually, now that you mention it, uh, Hoops gave a really awesome example of, um, of, of people of older age engaging in a sport. So he said he walked into a, uh, a nursing home. And he was going to visit someone, and he walked past this room, and there was a lot of people in there, and he goes in, and the residents are using a Nintendo Wii. <laughs> right. And they were using Wii bowling. And he said, oh, what are you guys doing? They said, oh, we're practicing. <laughs> he said, practicing? What are you practicing for? They went on to explain that every year, three nursing homes get together, three times a year, each nursing home hosts a bowling tournament. We bowling. <laughs> so they bust, so the other two will get on, they'll bust them in, and, they, and one place will host a wee bowling tournament, and they each take turns. And when he told me that, I couldn't believe that. But I mean, that is fantastic. I mean, that, that's kind of a way that technology is kind of helping us, in a sense. Because uh, you can do those kinds of things. I know uh, my wife's grandparents, they do wee bowling all the time, and they absolutely love it. Because again, you can immerse yourself in that and feel that sport. Um, my 70-year-old uncle plays on a hockey team, and their name is the Jerry Hat Tricks. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dave. You made some excellent points. Um, what I didn't hear was the shadow side of sport. Um, uh, some sports, in particular, really have inherent acts of violence within them. <laughs> And so I was wondering if, especially football um, mm -hmm. and hockey, um, and so I'm wondering if that came up in your conversations with your participants, and do you think that there's a place for the church um, in terms of critiquing sport, mm -hmm. or that, that shadow side of sport? Um, I think the church has to be very careful about that, because the way that we respond, again, can just make it an us versus them kind of thing. So I think that has to be a very measured response. It didn't come up the kind of the, the, the nasty side of sport. And that's why I say, I knew in this presentation, I couldn't just say, oh, everything is hunky-dory and positive, right? Because there are, there's two sides to sport. There's fighting in hockey, and a lot of people don't like fighting, right? Because it, it causes serious problems. But then, then again, with playing and just playing the game of hockey, you can get even, even more serious injuries. Um, I was, you know, if, if you ask me, should there be fighting in hockey? I would say no. Uh, personally, I don't like to see that kind of thing. But then again, I was reading, um, there was a newspaper article, I forget the, uh, the title of the newspaper, that, but they were interviewing Matt Cassian, who is a, uh, an NHL player for the Vancouver Canucks, I believe. And he said, um, he was asked about that, about fighting, and he said, well, you know what, the way I see it is, I'm standing up for my teammate. Someone else is being bullied, I'm standing up for them. And I think I have the right to do that, and I think that's a part of sport, and we need to stand up for one another. So, I don't know, he, he also says that you can, uh, he says, you know, it says in the Bible, ask and you receive, so uh, I can ask for a win, right? So, 
I, don't, I don't really know about that. But again, if you look at um, mixed martial artists, um, there is, you know, for some people say, well, that's just two men or two women getting into a ring and just beating the you-know-what out of each other. Um, but if you look at interviews with them, they say, it's not about me wanting to physically harm this person. It's, it's for me, it's, it's about using my abilities and wanting to win and get to the next stage. Um, I'll be honest, it's something I struggle with. It's, there, are, there is a nasty side to sports. I, I, I don't deny that. Um, one of the things that is great, though, is the repercussions of that, the nasty part, are being dealt with in a better way because now we actually care more about what happens to the person. For example, um, if anybody's a hockey fan, you might know that the Dallas Stars a gentleman collapsed while playing the other day. He collapsed on the bench. And his life was pretty much saved because now they not only have a team trainer, but they have a doctor waiting for both teams in case anything happens. They now have defibrillators all over hockey arenas because of a few years ago, someone collapsed on the bench. So the actual care of the person, and you can see they stopped the game, they canceled the game. The care of the person is becoming more and more important compared to how it was 20 years ago when you, know, you get bashed in the head, you get a concussion, you just say the, to your coach, yeah, I'm okay, and they send you back out on the ice. So I think there is the culture around that is changing because we do recognize what the implications of those kinds of things are. We're making progress to kind of uh, help with the, the kind of damaging result of that, but there isn't a lot around whether it is right or wrong. There is, you know, there's little arguments here and there. I'll be honest, it's something I struggle with too, so. We are at time, but thank you for these wonderful questions. And let's give Dave a hand for his uh, presentation.